Good. So uh, most of you know me. My name is Mark Reed. I am the Chief Executive of Fast Track Impact, but also a Professor of Rural, Entre rural Entrepreneurship. Still can't pronounce it. Uh, I'm the Centre Director at Scotland's Rural College. Uh, I am joined today by two colleagues, uh, Eric Jensen. Uh, and Sarah Bowman. Eric Janssen is from the Institute for Methods Change, uh, Sarah Bowman from uh, Trinity College Dublin. Uh, I'm going to be kicking us off uh, introducing this idea of planning our impact using two incredibly powerful tools. Eric is going to go into much more depth on the theory of change, uh, a real expert in this, uh, doing some leading work, uh, also thinking about how you can flip this from a planning tool into an evaluation tool. And Sarah is going to give us some fascinating insights into how both of these tools can be used in a real live situation. Situation. So a couple of case study um, uh, examples coming towards the end. Right, we'll speak each for around 15 minutes, so we'll make sure we've got 10 to 15 minutes of questions and discussion at the end, but keep those questions and ideas coming in the chat in the meantime. So I'm going to kick us off uh, and suggest to you that uh, this is a family of tools that can enable you to become significantly more efficient in what you do. From the very start of Fast Track Impact, uh, we realized that the key barrier to people engaging with impact was time. And I realized very quickly that the most effective way of enabling people to achieve impact when they didn't have time was to enable people to think strategically. If I have in mind that one thing or that few things that I need to achieve and a plan for how I'm going to get there, I can marshal what little time and resource I have to make that thing happen. Rather than the scattergun or opportunistic uh, approach, that is very reactive uh, and often uh, actually just wastes time going down dead ends and doing things that ultimately don't work or uh, only take you part of the way to where you want to go. And I get lots of great engagement, but I don't ever get that ultimate benefit uh, or impact. Uh, and uh, I'm using the, the, this word benefit as a shortcut to impact. And if you want uh, my peer-reviewed cross-disciplinary uh, definition of impact. This is the, the first such um, uh, version uh, of this uh, in the peer-reviewed literature uh, that I'm putting a link to my article defining this here. Uh, a more nuanced uh, definition there, but uh, emphasizing the subjectivity of the concept. So, uh, this is about making a plan, but these two tools will enable us to create a clear impact plan. Uh, we'll know what the impacts are, the benefits ultimately, the, ultimately that we want to see. It's not just going to be a whole load of noise doing engagement for the sake of it. Uh, we're going to be able to then select the kind of approaches that are most likely to actually work. Uh, we're going to have a plan A and a plan B and maybe a plan C. Uh, we can create some forks in the road, especially if we use a, a theory of change. Uh, we'll have a sense then of, of how ultimately we are going to get to those objectives uh, so that we can prioritize the kinds of activities that are most likely to work for a given stakeholder group uh, and actually take us to impact. And uh, as uh, Eric will explain, we'll be able to then uh, focus our evaluation. Uh, the uh, logic model that I'm going to give you has uh, two columns which are focused on evaluation and uh, you can flip theory of change on its head and uh, use it to uh, do an evaluation uh, in and of itself. It can create evaluation evidence. So uh, fascinating stuff uh, coming in a moment. But there is a starting point for me, which is perhaps not where you might expect. So we're so focused on the impact that we actually end up missing the point, which is we are trying to help people. And of course, these could be future generations, they could be non-human species, but we're trying to generate benefit. And if we try and do that from our ivory towers in our own imagination, uh, then quite often we get that wrong. And we take that scattergun approach, uh, throwing out ideas from the top of our ivory towers, which often miss the mark or inadvertently squash people and give us negative unintended consequences. So let's start in instead by finding out who these people are who might at least vaguely be interested in our research. 
Uh, and maybe let's try and prioritize these using some stakeholder analysis methods that will enable us to do this in a more systematic way. Uh, more in my book, The Research Impact Handbook, and I'm giving you a free link to that in the chat just now. Uh, also, uh, have a look uh, in the peer-reviewed literature, and uh, you'll see my uh, highly cited paper on this, and I'm going to give you the uh, paper that I am writing at the moment. So this is not um, for citation yet. Um, uh, we'll have an authorship order by the end of this week, hopefully, but you can see that there. This is my three eyes approach to stakeholder analysis. Uh, so yeah, who's interested, but who has influence and who might be most impacted? So great, I get those key stakeholders with high interest, high influence, high impact. Uh, I think about whether or not they will be trying to undermine what I'm doing and block it, uh, whether they'll be impacted positively or negatively. But I also don't forget those hard to reach vulnerable groups who are not actually interested, in, at least in the way that I'm framing this. It's my job to take this to them. Uh, they don't have any influence. By definition, they are the poor, the marginalized and the oppressed. Uh, and yet, uh, they may be impacted so more than anyone else. And it is our duty to work out how we can take this to them. Now, uh, in the chat, I'm going to give you a link to my uh, impact templates. Uh, these are editable templates, so you have to download these from the Dropbox link. I'll give you these all in an email afterwards, along with all of the other links uh, that are in the chat. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have in this uh, a couple of interesting things. So you've got um, uh, the, the uh, stakeholder analysis template, uh, but you've also got this logic model. So this is my fast track impact planning template, uh, more in the book and again in the peer reviewed literature, uh, but follow the worked example because this is what it looks like. Um, we've got our impact goal. And remember, we are uh, now reaching out to those people that we identified in our stakeholder analysis, and we are having conversations with them. Uh, and at minimum, those conversations inspire the impact goals that we write here. Uh, in an ideal world, we actually co-produce these. Uh, so it may be that we actually do this as a group exercise. I've done this in workshops, blowing this up and putting it onto the walls. Uh, but the key point is that I talk to some real people who are actually interested in this who might be affected by this uh, and with them in mind now and maybe even with their help I come up with those impact goals. I've done the stakeholder analysis so I know who those target stakeholders or publics are and what aspects of this they're interested in and different groups are going to be interested in different parts of the research or different outcomes of the research depending on which way uh, our findings ultimately go. Uh, each of those different groups are then going to have different interests, different limitations, capacities, uh, languages, all of this stuff. And so we need to adapt our activities to engage those groups effectively. And it is those conversations that we have that will enable us to now not do a one size fits all approach, but to create activities that will resonate and that will really work with each of those different groups. Uh, then, uh, as we said, we're going to use this uh, for evaluation. And for me, you do this right at the start. So what are the indicators of engagement? How do I know that, uh, that all of that engagement is working? So nobody turned up. Huh. Oh, why not? Let's course correct. And this gives you the formative feedback you need to make sure that what you're doing actually is working. And it increases the likelihood that you actually achieve impact. We've also got then indicators of our impact and our progress towards impact. So some of those early stage impacts, I've changed people's understanding and awareness. Uh, I perhaps changed people's attitudes. Uh, there are some behavior changes that are beginning to happen uh, that we can see. Maybe I've built capacity. And yes, perhaps now eventually I'm getting those longer term changes. We've reduced greenhouse gas emissions. We've uh, enhanced people's health or whatever it might be. And I've put and means of measurement in here. Um, uh, referencing some of uh, the, the, the work on this um, uh, that, that you might be familiar with, uh, logical framework analysis comes from development studies. Uh, they talk about means of verification. Um, but I think this is really useful to build into this because it's very easy to come up with these pie in the sky, well, this is what success would look like kind of ideas. And then you're asking yourself, yeah, but how would we get the data? Ah, okay, this is not actually viable. We can't do this. So let's make this real. And what I discover at this point as I'm working through this with people very often is that uh, I look 
back at that impact goal and I see, yeah, you know what, it was a bit woolly. And now I'm getting this specificity, this color, this shape to my impact goal, which actually enables me to, uh, to target something much more effective. Uh, so I've done that at the beginning, and now these are things I can check back in with every quarter or every year to see how I'm getting on. And I can colour code these if I want. And if this is consistently red, no, it's not working, I know I need to take action. I don't just leave this to take its own course, I'm keeping track. And now Eric will talk a bit more about uh, uh, risks and assumptions and how you can build this into a theory of change. I think it's really important that we think about this up front, we think about how we're going to mitigate those risks. Uh, this is uh, also particularly valuable if you're doing this pre-award. So for me, any large bids, if you want to be competitive on impact, you need to use some kind of tool, uh, whether it's a logic model or a theory of change, whether or not you actually put that table or diagram into your proposal, because that's what gives you the specificity of thinking to be credible. And I want to identify and mitigate the risks up front rather than my reviewers or panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs> and this will help you to be way more competitive. And finally, who's responsible for what and when? Do we need any resources? So pre-award, we can uh, apply for them. Uh, but post awards, yeah, uh, this is something that ideally I am co-producing. So who are those people who can help? And as you'll see in my worked example, uh, yeah, my name is here quite a lot. Uh, but actually, uh, this is something that I have outsourced to my stakeholders because actually I found people who are interested enough in this that my impact is their impact, their impact is my impact, we're working together. And this is part of the reason why this helps save you time. I think about this in a strategic, structured way. I prioritize the key impacts that are actually viable uh, with my team, with this resource, uh, with these stakeholders. And I find people, like-minded people out there who want to see that same change. And so even if I'm a PhD student, I've got a limited time, a limited amount of resource. I find others now who want to see the same change as me, who throw staff time and resources and help my way. Now, I'm going to introduce theory of change and uh, if building on this co-productive idea, explain how I use my, um, uh, my uh, uh, impact planning template to feed into a theory of change. Um, uh, Eric's going to build on this and give you some more advanced techniques. But basically, this is how, in theory, we get from where we are now to the change we want to see. So that's why it's called a theory of change. Uh, and we want to understand what are those ultimate outcomes uh, or impact uh, and define them, uh, but also the intermediate inputs, activities, uh, outputs and such like that we will see on the way there. So we can visualize all these different pathways. So we've got a plan A, we've got a plan B, we can uh, foresee what we're going to need to do. Uh, if all this jargon uh, is problematic, don't worry. Um, uh, and I'll show you an example uh, of this um, in a moment. Uh, I find academics in particular get confused, uh, and I think with good reason, because there are lots of outcomes in particular that if you take my definition of impact would also be impact. So let's not worry about this. The key thing is that we've got uh, some research that then leads to some early stage impacts, which ultimately leads to some end stage or uh, more advanced uh, impacts. Uh, but from the bottom up, uh, my starting point, as I've said, is I need to know who my stakeholders are. I might then also identify a subset of those stakeholders who are going to become project partners, people I'm going to co-produce this whole thing with, because I can't invite everyone, especially if I identify, say, 100 or 200 stakeholders. And then with those partners, I am completing my impact planning templates. Uh, once I've brought those in, I'm analyzing them, I'm thematically grouping those impact goals, and I'm starting to look for causal chains, first of all, between those goals. Huh. So an increase in understanding led to an attitudinal change, led to a behavior change. Some of those behaviors were decisions, some of the decisions were policies. One of those policies then led to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Huh. Okay, great, I've already now got uh, part of a theory of change just by linking together those impacts. Uh, then I need to work out, right, how do I get from the impacts back to all of these engagement activities that I've identified uh, in my templates, all the way back to the research itself. Uh, and when I look at that, I have a whole load of ideas in those impact templates uh, for different activities I could choose uh, that help me to get there and fill in the gap. Uh, ultimately, though, you do have to take a bit of a top-down approach to this, to organize this strategically, especially if you were doing this pre-award. 
so uh, we are researchers after all, and we have to make sure that, uh, yeah, there are lots of things we uh, can do, but at least some of these need to be linked to our research, uh, ideally. Uh, quite often you'll discover that there are biases, uh, so there is a focus on one type of impact, um, uh, they all link back to one work package uh, of our research, for example, and we might want to also make sure that we're balancing across different themes, countries, partners, um, and that kind of stuff. But you put that all together, and uh, here's one uh, that, uh, that I led uh, for a £20 million uh, research programme. Looks complicated, but when you consider how much this is trying to capture, it's not that difficult. Uh, and in this case, we have uh, sim simplified uh, all of these different uh, pathways. You'll see some more complex ones uh, in Eric's presentation uh, through this lens um, device. Uh, and then the point we're trying to make here is uh, in this middle section that we've got a whole load of different impact generating activities. Uh, but it's not that simple as usually one thing leads to at least one other thing before you've got then shorter term and, out uh, and longer term impacts. And if you want to use the, the jargon, we can call them outputs and impact. Uh, but this can take any form and there are lots and lots of different shapes and sizes, so get creative. So more in the chat, I'm going to give you a link to my research-based co-productive approach to developing a theory of change, but now I'm going to hand over to Eric. Over to you. Hi. Uh, so we're, we're already getting some interesting questions in the chat, uh, just to flag to, to Mark in case he wants to pick up the baton there. Uh, so I'm going to be picking up from where Mark left off. I will share screens as well here. And the the kind of core story that I want to tell is is quite similar to, to what Mark was highlighting, which is that we do this kind of thing. We use these kinds of approaches in order to be more strategic. So that's the kind of the core point for why we should bother to do this kind of thing is so that we can take an approach to impact that is likely to be more effective and less likely to waste the opportunity to actually make a difference with your project, program, activity, whatever it is. So uh, my background is social sciences. Uh, I, I work across a number of organizations in the United States, uh, internationally. Uh, I'm a consultant for UNESCO uh, on a monitoring project at the moment. Uh, and I'm also a part-time sociology professor at the University of Warwick. Uh, the kinds of examples that you'll see here and uh, the examples that you'll see in the kind of wider work that we share is from the kind of consulting and uh, grant funded projects that uh, that we often do. So that includes a number of organizations, both those doing public engagement and impact initiatives, research organizations, uh, as well as policy and other kinds of institutions. So as I said, the, the jumping off point, the, the whole point for why you should bother with doing something like uh, an, a logic model or a theory of change is because it lets you target your approach more effectively. So that means that you need to start with a very clear understanding of what exactly is it that you're trying to achieve. So what are the impacts that you're trying to have? As Mark mentioned, ideally, you're developing that understanding in a collaborative way with uh, as good an understanding as you can of the people that you're trying to benefit, especially. Uh, I think that's the most important uh, stakeholder is the people that are supposed to be gaining whatever benefit it is uh, that you're targeting for your, for your project. Because if you understand their needs, then you're more likely to be able to tailor what you're doing to their needs and therefore to be more effective. So the nature of the objectives that you're trying to achieve this isn't uh, a kind of merely a paper exercise. This is something that should be a kind of orienting focus when you're setting up your effort at developing impact. So being clear and specific and concrete with your impact objectives allows you to check, is the thing that you're planning to do actually going to be the most effective way to deliver that impact objective? If you're not clear about the impact objectives, if they're 
if they're really vague things like I want to raise awareness about science or something like that, then you're never going to be able to choose the most effective tool to reach that outcome because the outcome itself is not clear enough. And there is a key distinction here, and this, this connects to the, the tool that's called a logic model, uh, which is called, this is the distinction between outputs and outcomes. So outputs are the things that you're actually doing in your impact activities. So I could objectively describe what you've done, who you did it with, what kind of activity it was. That should not be mixed together with the outcomes of the program or activity. And that's the difference that you've actually made. So how are people different? How is their thinking different? How is an institution different? Uh, you know, what has actually changed? What are people saying or doing differently because this thing happened? And this is a, a crucial starting point for evaluation because we, we target in the evaluation the outcome side most often. So if these things are mixed together, so if the kind of description of what you're doing is all muddled together with the outcomes that you're trying to have, then it's difficult to evaluate which aspects of the program or activity actually delivered the intended outcomes. So one of the things that is often very challenging in this stage of defining objectives is being as clear and specific and explicit as possible. So not relying on abstract concepts that we kind of feel like everybody understands and everybody supports, like let's increase awareness or learning or something vague like that. We need to be as specific and concrete as possible with the definition of impact objectives. So I'd like you to uh, use the chat to get a little bit of interactivity going here, if you feel comfortable doing so. Uh, and that's to start thinking about for your own, you know, pick a, an activity, pick a, a project, and think about at least one impact objective that you can state very clearly and explicitly and concretely what it's aiming to achieve. So try to craft this statement, this one sentence in a clear and concrete way and go ahead and share it in the group chat and uh, others who uh, who are willing to help can give you uh, replies and feedback you can do direct replies to give feedback about that impact objective and the kinds of feedback that you need when you're developing impact objectives are uh, how could this be more clear how could this be more explicit is this something that you know it makes sense to me as the one writing the objective but does it make sense to other people is it clear enough that it's intelligible for others? What exactly it is that I want to deliver as the, the impact? So theory of change, uh, Mark has introduced this concept already. I'm going to just uh, add a little bit more. So the general concept with the theory of change is that you can use it at the beginning of a project or activity or program in order to clarify your impact plan. So this should be a comprehensive description of how and why change is going to happen. So it is not expected to be an exact model of what will really happen uh, once you get into the messy realities of delivering the program. In fact, you, are, you would always expect to see adjustments and change as things actually are progressing and being implemented in practice. It's a way to orient and ensure that you're approaching things in a strategic way, that you don't have a big gap in your plan so that once you actually start delivering it, you realize, oh no, I left out a crucial step in this impact process. So a good theory of change is systematic and it clarifies step-by-step, step-by-step, by step, how you get from your starting point to the impact that you want to deliver. And it involves asking yourself a number of questions like what exactly is the problem I'm trying to fix here? Who am I trying to fix it with? How do I reach those the people that I'm trying to, to fix this problem with? Uh, that kind of thing. So there's a, a um, summary of the kind of categories that you can use as a practical worksheet 
here that uh, that will provide a download link in the chat. And so I won't I won't pursue that much further here. But the the point of doing this kind of exercise is that it lets you choose your approach in a way that avoids making fundamental mistakes. Like, for example, if you want to, you know, a, a, an example I recall particularly clearly is um, a program in Brazil where the, the goal was to change poaching behavior, like to reduce the uh, seizing of wild animals to, to use in the pet trade. And the approach to solve that problem was to deliver education programs to young kids in schools. And there just wasn't a good kind of theory of change for how you get from delivering educational content to young children to changing the behavior of the adults who are actually doing this, this um, problematic behavior. And so that's, that was kind of an extreme example, but there are many cases where a plan, a program looks good when you kind of first think about it, but once you get into the details, you realize, okay, if I could just add this here, uh, if I could engage this kind of stakeholder here, then I really have a strong pathway to impact. Uh, and the theory of change helps you to clarify this. So I'm gonna show one example here. This is from a project uh, that Mark and I did with uh, a research group in Scotland focusing on water called Crew. And mainly I just wanna highlight the categories here. So you can see that there are uh, the first the first layer is called impact activities. So these were things in this project that were done to develop impact. So they were steps like creating a report, uh, going through a process. In this case, they use a lot of co-production, a lot of uh, collaborative approaches. So there were specific things they did to build uh, participation from relevant stakeholders to increase the chances of delivering impact. But there's also the kind of classic impact activity at the bottom of their crew final report and summary on website. And then there's a plan, like the, the idea is that that is supposed to ultimately lead to certain kinds of impacts, like the, the professional services delivered by the government being better at the end. Uh, in this case, this is fo focusing on flooding. But the steps in the middle, this is where theory of change provides uh, some added value is the missing middle from the kind of, we're gonna do this and it's gonna lead to this great impact at the end. The theory of change fills in middle steps. So uh, these are things like getting buy-in, getting support from other stakeholder groups that are involved in this kind of area, uh, involving stakeholders in amplifying research findings. So that it's not just an academic publication and that's it, that kind of thing. And then there are, contextual factors, there are kind of other things going on. We're rarely doing an impact activity in a kind of vacuum with nothing else happening. So it's important to think about how does our impact activity connect with other things that are going on in the, in the context around this impact activity. So things like there were other pilot activities going on. There's other funded projects that are getting at similar things. So maybe we can work with them to amplify impact. So those are enabling factors that help to support, underpin, and increase the, but also their potential, you could also imagine there being barriers there that could get in the way of impact. So this is the general concept is that you map out the steps to go from, I'm, I'm going to do these things in order to lead to these impacts. How exactly is that supposed to happen? So after this workshop, if you'd like to develop your own theory of change, you can use the, the worksheet that I, uh, I showed earlier. We'll, um, we'll provide that again in the follow-up materials and start to answer some of those questions. It's always valuable to get feedback when you are developing your theory of change. As Mark mentioned, the ideal is to get feedback from stakeholders and to even to co-produce with stakeholders, but that's not always feasible. So in the scenario where you have to kind of come up with this alone and get some feedback from colleagues uh, or even friends and family, uh, the kinds of critical feedback you want are about your assumptions. Like, is there something that I'm assuming is going to work here that doesn't seem realistic to, to other people? That's a crucial thing to find out. And you want as much kind of critical feedback as you can when you're developing your theory of change, because you don't want to find out 
when you're halfway through delivering something that there was a crucial step that everybody else would have told you was a bad idea, uh, but you only find out later that, uh, that this was something that was really obvious to other people. So the, the end goal here from my perspective is to go about creating impact in a way that's evidence-based. So that means that you take a targeted approach so that you're developing impact in a way that aligns with the needs of, your, of the people that you're trying to benefit. And also that you're going about this in a way that's strategic, that's maximizing the effectiveness as much as you can, given your constraints and the resources you have, that you're not missing opportunities and you're not kind of spending chances to make a difference where it's less likely to be effective. And then ultimately, if you take these kinds of steps and you evaluate to see how are things going, are things going according to plan? If not, what kind of adaptations can I make? Uh, a kind of evidence-based approach involves clarifying your approach strategically and then evaluating along the way to refine and improve as you go along. So that's the, that's the reason for using a theory of change as part of a wider evidence-based approach. Here are some ideas for possible next steps. You can have a go at creating a theory of change uh, yourself, as I mentioned, and uh, there's further feedback and advice uh, available uh, through a number of these sources, uh, like the, the link that Mark, Mark shared, and also uh, I primarily do evaluation training at methodsforchange.org. Uh, okay, I'll hand over to Sarah at this point. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Great. Over to you, Sarah. Fantastic. Can everyone see that screen? Am I sharing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A lovely sunny day here in Dublin. So I'll, I'll, I'm up here like a, a zebra on screen. Um, I'm delighted to join you today. Um, it's great to, to be here. And I hope by the end of today's session, you're feeling a bit like this fella on the, on the slide, that you're happy about the thought of impact planning and logic modeling, that this shouldn't feel like a box ticking exercise. It shouldn't feel like something that's forced upon you. It really should feel like something that's helping you be more successful and, and helping your teams be more strategic in their approaches. So I am, my background is that I'm, I'm currently working at Trinity College Dublin as Director of Strategic Engagement and Impact Assessment. And I'm working on a project which is uh, focusing in on providing supports for research teams in order to plan for impact, maximize impact, or certainly um, assess impact. And the information that I'm gonna share with you today is based on that experience, but also based on working with Campus Engage, which is our a national organization within the Irish Universities Association. And we work with the groups to, to understand the, the concepts that we're also going to talk about today image on this slide comes from the work that I've been doing. So I'm coming from a very practical uh, world of change, which is I've worked with about 1200 communities on built environment interventions. So how does the built environment impact health and well-being? What sort of behaviors are allowed because of our physical constructs? And so for instance, if we wanted to encourage children to walk safely to school, what sort of physical infrastructure would need to be in place? What sort of programmatic opportunities? What sort of policy initiatives? What sort of people? So when I'm coming from a change perspective, I'm looking at the policy landscape, I'm looking at people, the, who's involved, and then I'm looking at the projects, the demonstrations, which are gonna build capacity for change. And so I joined Trinity College back in 2014, and I was really curious about how these principles of engagement and involvement and impact play into a research life cycle. Um, and if we're gonna be talking about impact, and we're gonna be talking about an impact journey, how, what does that mean? And so as both Eric and uh, Mark spoke about, it's bigger than just hopping right down into the nuts and bolts of logic models. You fundamentally need to understand the landscape that you're part of. And this is fundamentally understanding the national or governmental policy that is aligned with your work to local strategic plans from your institutions, that there's, that there's some understanding of impact that is around you and around your work that we need to understand and tap into as we begin to establish your impact journey. And so the, the pieces that are listed, the bullets that are there on the slide are things that you should be reflecting on. We typically get into jumping down into teaming and activities and outputs, 
But on, if you don't have a good understanding of the context in which your work lives, um, the assumptions, the obligations, the commitments, you're, you will be less strategic in terms of identifying opportunities for, for impact. We're lucky in the Irish context that we have Campus Engage that led this national consultation on engagement and impact. So we have a definition for engaged research. We have a framework which looks at different components of a research life cycle and opportunities for um, involving and engaging stakeholders through reflective questions, but also a planning for impact, how to guide. And it's very similar to what Mark and um, Eric shared and that it utilizes logic models and theories of change. It is working with teams. It's, it's informed by the work of Mark and Eric in, uh, for sure, led by Kate Morris within Campus Engage, this national consultation. And we have um, a, a, a impact categories that have emerged along with indicative actions. So uh, potential indicators that, that teams could, could, could look at in terms of understanding their impact. So when we're working with research teams, it's again, you want to make it easier. You want to support the process. And what you're ultimately doing is working with researchers to help them better articulate their impact. And so if we can provide these tools and resources to do that, it's a win for us. The point is, I know a lot of the questions coming in are around the different theories or the different underlying assumptions. You're going to figure out what works best for you given the context you're in and your thematic area of focus. So we have research impact officers in arts and humanities. We have a research impact officer in medicine. How impact is understood is, is, is different across those faculties and those thematic areas, but it's different on a project by project, person by person level as well. So you want to fundamentally understand in terms of your activities and your outputs, what are we doing? Who's involved? Why does it matter? Who's gonna use this information? Is it in the format appropriate? So if I'm trying to engage with policymakers, what is the output from this that is going to make it easier for me to engage with policymakers? For me to, if, if my ultimate outcome is evidence informed policymaking, how do I ensure that this research is built in collaboration? It is recognizing the policy landscape. It is producing outputs that can be used by policymakers. So we, we talk about kind of what's above the line very well. We also need to talk about what's below the line, which is what's going to be different. You know, what will be adopted? What will be applied? What will be changed? So everything that Eric and, and Mark spoke about, and we really want to understand those beneficiaries, who benefits, for how long, and what role did this project or this team or this initiative have in that change space? So if this is a temporary change versus something that was gonna happen anyway, we want to be really authentic about the roles we're playing. So I wanna share with you, an example of uh, from Trinity Center for Aging and Intellectual Disability. This is a group that I've worked with over the past seven years, and we've been really looking at strategic approaches to understanding impact. And the center is, uh, the, the vision for the center is that they will uh, work uh, uh, nationally and internationally to really enhance health, well being, and quality of life for people who are aging with an intellectual disability. And they've consolidated their efforts into sort of three key strategic priorities, which are listed there. They're gonna conduct high quality engaged research that will improve our understanding of aging with an intellectual disability. It's an under-researched area. We're gonna support the development of people, others, individuals, so they're prepared to lead change initiatives. And then we're gonna enable this co-created knowledge translation and mobilization to deliver change. And underneath these three strategic priorities, the team has done a really lovely job of bulleting in some objectives. So they have a, a, a flagship research project, a longitudinal study on aging with an intellectual disability and a suite of engaged research projects, which will be advanced annually. They're, this, this, they're, 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 they're long running studies, but at the same time, they are uh, each year, they go through this strategic day where they take assessment of what's been accomplished and they begin to plan for the next year. They're looking at these strategic priorities, these objectives, like increasing collaborations or promoting the inclusion of people with an intellectual disability in, in their research. So the idea is they're each year on an annual basis, they're bringing together the key stakeholders, the core advisory groups, and they're saying, how did we do? And how do we position ourselves for success? In terms of supporting the development of, of others, it's everything from the cap and gown images, the MSCs, the PhDs, the career progression, but they offer this suite of educational offerings, which are very bespoke badging, 
all the way up to working with you know groups like a, um, an all party uh, a, a working group from uh, government, which is around helping people be more effective in their jobs. So how can we support you? And what's beautiful about this approach is once you have a culture of impact and impact assessment built into the work you're doing, you're actively looking for these opportunities. You're looking for opportunities to position one another. You're recognizing successes sooner. You're building on those successes for the next success. So your outcomes from one project often becomes your inputs for the next, right? You're, it's, it's, it's a living, breathing, moving thing impact. It's not a plan that sits on a desk and, and, and we just reference every once in a while. So the third uh, strategic priority for this group is around this co-created knowledge translation and mobilization. They're serving as advisors to governments. They're trialing interventions with key collaborators. They're translating knowledge in fun and creative ways. So this is PPALS. This is a, a physical activity leadership program in which people with an intellectual disability become trained in physical activity leadership. They then work with their peers to increase healthy behavior. So they're providing opportunities across these different uh, initiatives. So how do you get from strategic priorities into progress on this impact journey? Well, as I mentioned, this team looks at those strategic priorities and the objectives that are aligned underneath each of them. And on their strategy days and in their annual reporting, they're taking a look at the progress that was made in terms of the, the initiatives that are running and their alignment with these categories. But it's this piece that I think we're often missing. We do this logic modeling and to Eric's point and Mark's point is the assessment component that we really need to be paying attention to. How do we know what success looks like? Who's involved in that? What are the parameters? What are the criteria? What data? Who are we engaging with to really fundamentally understand what's different? Both in the planning phase, what could be different, what should be different, what might be different to the assessment phase, retrospective analysis, what is different, what did change, what's, what's now unique because this project is in the world. And then the, 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 the other piece, which is around communications. We do all of this assessment, we do all of this work, and then we don't tell anybody about it. And so it's whoop, on to the next thing, and we're not necessarily positioning our people and our teams for success. So one of the projects that uh, this group, Trinity Center for Aging and Intellectual Disability, wanted to advance was a uh, intellectual disability memory service. That we had memory services for the general population, but not specific to people with an intellectual disability. And research emerging from Ireland um, and internationally as well was showing that people with Down syndrome were at much higher rates for developing dementia at earlier ages. So this was a longitudinal study that was run through Tr Trinity in which 77 women with Down syndrome over the age of 35 were uh, assessed over this 20 year period. And of those 77 women with Down syndrome, 97% went on to develop dementia, okay? And you compare that, their average onset age was 55 years. You compare that to a much lower percentage and higher age in the general population. For those women who had both Down syndrome and dementia, they 80% developed a new onset epilepsy. Again, very different from the general population. And that while we thought the average length of time between diagnosis and death was shorter, what this study also showed was actually there was a longer period of time and that women were living with dementia for up to 20 years as part of this study. This was concurrent with loads of research coming out from national and international partners, which were saying the same thing. Something's going on. We understand the Down syndrome and dementia. Maybe there's an implication of chromosome 21. We're not sure, but this warrants greater investigation, right? So this was happening. And at that time, the lead author from this study said, we have got to do something about it. The group that is most at risk, that is most impacted, has no very little services available for them, right? That international research says at the age of 35, people with Down syndrome should be assessed there should be this baseline assessment. This is the exception rather than the norm in the Irish context. We're not doing it good enough. We need to do better. And to the point someone asked a question about motivation, I would say we need inspirational achievers. We need people who are out there, kind of the, you know, the plows who are out there pushing ahead and motivating teams to say, it's not enough. We have this research, what can we do about it? So if anybody has ever worked with me on impact assessment, they know the two word question that I will ask over and over and over again, so what? So what? 
you want to do this research, so what? What's different, so what? And if you continue to ask that question, you put your statement up there, this is my impact statement, you ask, so what? And you keep asking, so what? You will actually get to a sort of an articulated, refined understanding of what you're hoping to achieve. So in 2020, this pilot memory service was launched in collaboration with uh, Trinity College Dublin, Avista Health and Talley University Hospital. I'm going to give the ending away, which was based on the pilot and the assessment that happened, permanent funding was allocated and this memory clinic is now part of the research uh, and healthcare landscape in Ireland with allocation from government's budget on an annual basis to keep this going. So how did the team do this, right? And that's really what I want to talk about today, to Mark's point and to Eric's point, this valuable effort of co-creation. For whom is this relevant? We bring in the relevant stakeholders, we work with them, we ask them what could success look like. This is a great example of the IDS Tilda team working in, in training. We're training researchers by working with people with an intellectual disability, so they're more effective in the field. This model of co-creation sits across all of the work of the center. And so we're building capacity for change. So the value, the process of logic modeling is valuable. And you've got to, you're too time poor not to make your processes valuable. So the team looked at the inputs, everything they were bringing to the table, the supportive landscapes, all of the pilot funding, the alignment of research, the opportunity to, with this focused timeline. So these inputs to, to Eric and Mark's point, they were really well established around why this team, what they were bringing to the table that made them the right group to lead these activities. And it was interesting going back to look at the logic modeling to see that these core activities, the alignment of the six of them really stood the test of time. So they, they knew that they had to develop the memory service. They needed to formally launch it. They needed to host a suite of research projects across the, the life of this pilot. They needed to perform a certain number of clinical assessments and diagnosis and begin to coordinate post-diagnostic plans if they were to effectively assess this pilot and make the case either for lessons learned, this was a good pilot, it needs to be modified, or this is something that could actually now become part of permanent infrastructure. So I won't spend time going through all of these slides, but you will get the slides so you can look at them yourselves. And this isn't the exhaustive list of the logic model simply because you won't be able to read it, it's in Excel. But the idea here is that they went through each of those key activities and they began to identify the sub activities that sat in underneath them. So if you're developing a memory service, everything from the business of the business, the operational side of it had its suite of activities. The launching had its suite of activities. The clinical assessment had its suite of activities. And associated with all of those were the, the outputs, not to overwhelm people and not to make people panic, but to say, if for instance, we know that we need to build uh, a, a health promotion campaign as part of the launching of the memory service, can we tie that to the sort of post-diagnostic support planning that's going to be needed? How do we begin to leverage these things? We've small number of team, limited resources. What can we tie together to leverage and maximize impact? And that's what effective logic modeling will also help you do. And then ultimately, when it came to understanding uh, their, their outcomes and their impact, we had to decide well, what, what are the key messages we need to focus on? And so we looked at the national policy landscape and the payback framework from the Health Research Board. So what do we want to see happening? What does government say they want to see happening as a consequence of research? They want to see the utilization of research in terms of transforming healthcare delivery. And the outcomes that were listed there were part of their payback framework, the things that they wanted to see and that aligned with our efforts. And so then we began to list out the corroborating evidence that we would be able to put in there in support, because if you do this as part of your logic modeling, what's beautiful is you have an assessment plan that's built into your project. You're not forgetting to get data. You're making it easier to assess what's happening in real time. So the things with numbers around them allow for both the quantitative and the qualitative piece. We knew we were going to need testimonials. We knew we were going to need care uh, uh, experiences. We knew we were going to need to be able to pull some level of patient outcomes. And so how do we build that into this logic modeling? And then similarly, just to very clearly point out, we also needed to show that this underutilized space, that we have this wealth of information, this wealth of opportunity, it is untapped. We needed to make people feel like, if I don't invest in this, I've lost. And so to be able to say, look, at the end of this trial, you know, for the first time, we are going to have baseline data on incidence and prevalence of dementia 
in people with an intellectual disability, which is currently unknown in Ireland. And we're gonna have the first biobank of blood samples from people with an intellectual disability. We now have these assets, right? They're outputs from this project, they're inputs in terms of our next iteration. This is now part of our infrastructure that we can maximize. And so it's that rolling idea to, con to consider as you're moving forward. So just in the interest of time, what I wanna say, these are all scalable tools. I've used them for individuals working uh, on promotions. The outcome, I need a job, I want a job. How do we begin to, 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 to look at your individual personalized narrative to make that make sense? Um, at the, so one of the projects we've been working on, Dr. Giovanna Lima, who I know is on the call, was, is, is this researcher impact framework where we align impact areas with outcome statements, your activities and outputs with key evidence, reach use and relevance data in order to craft effective impact narratives. And it gives researchers at individual levels some guidance. I won't spend time on this slide because I'm over, but what I do want to say is it's that impact narrative. It's not just a collection of data that is sitting in proximity to one another. It is now how that is articulated, communicated through an engaged process that is ultimately gonna position you for success. So just be very clear why you're engaging in an impact assessment, why now? What data do you need? What narratives do you need to get your digital house in order so that you can make the compelling case? Who are you engaging with? Why and how to fundamentally understand outcomes from your work? And then how are you gonna organize that information into audience specific publications, purpose-driven communications that really ensure that the process is valuable to your current effort and your future efforts. So I, I hope that was useful. I hope you're smiling and uh, uh, just wanna thank you for your time today.